now it's my pleasure to invite to the floor Bill Proudman. Um, Bill is the founding partner and CEO of White Men as Full Diversity Partners, and he has been involved in engaging men in the campaign for um, diversity and inclusion, and I think particularly with everything that's been going on, particularly in the United States and other parts, and we talked a lot about this um, this morning at the two sessions, the spike in misogyny that we're, we're seeing and reading. So Bill is going to share with us lots of, lots of his experience. But the thing that he wants to share with you that he doesn't put much in the public domain is his hidden secret, is that at the age of 17, was it Bill? That he, 16, he took his first flight ever and went from Portland to New Zealand to a sheep farm. And like one of our other speakers this morning, that is where he learned about being different and being other. And he's incorporated that experience to basically the rest of, rest of your career. So please join me in welcoming Bill to take the floor. Thank you so much. the research that you have and sort of, I sort of resembled myself as I was listening to you talk to mid-level managers because it feels like that's what in the last 30 years of my life have been like of going through all of those practices. So in 1987, I had just moved from the Eastern part of the US to the Western part. And I was in the midst of a career change trying to figure out what I was gonna do in this new land that I had landed in. And I, at the insistence of a colleague of mine, went to a two hour workshop at a conference of a professional organization I was a part of at that point. And it was about difference and building alliance. And I thought I was doing leadership work at the time, uh, relatively early in my career. And I said, I, I don't have any issues related to difference. I'm a good guy. I'm, and I went to this two hour session and literally, as I like to say, the door to the parallel universe opened that day. And I stepped into that and recognized my privilege as a man, my privilege because of my white skin, my privilege because of speaking English as a first language, which has come to be seen as a liability for me as I've gotten older and only speak one language and I'm around people that are fluent in four or five. Uh, my privilege as a temporarily able-bodied person, my privilege as a, at least growing up working class and now moving into a middle upper class economic environment. And I never have saw any of this because I just assumed, well, that's all because of my hard work, good looks and great intelligence. And the reality is, is that I've been afforded things in my life largely because of memberships in groups that I'm not even aware that I'm even a part of. And for the last 30 years, uh, for, well, for the first 10 years, so from 87 to 97, uh, when I was doing cultural diversity work, I was noticing two things happening. One is I wasn't getting a lot of work. That might have been because I wasn't very good. But let's assume that I actually had some value. I was noticing I'd get more work when I was paired with a white woman in the US or a man of woman of color. Because what would happen is that I experienced what I call the potted plant syndrome, where when the issues would come up, my or the, our clients, these managers, senior leaders largely, would always defer the issue to my colleague. And it usually came from people that look like me. And then I watched those really intelligent, passionate, caring men, many of which were white, do the same thing on their teams where they would always defer the issue to whoever on the team didn't look like them. And I said, I don't think if inclusion is a leadership imperative, which I certainly believe, I don't think this is a sustainable practice where you've got some on a team putting others on the team in charge of not just their day job, but saying, how do we build an inclusive culture? And I watched this happen regardless of the industry I was in. So fast forward, Three years ago, I'm sitting, I live in Portland, Oregon, on the western part of the US. I'm sitting in the waiting room of the car wash, waiting for my car to come out. And up comes, uh, I look down on the table, and this is the Bloomberg Business Week cover. Um, actually, let me go the other way. <laughs> there it is. New fertility procedure gives women the quest and the choice to have it all. That was the, that's the little print. So what do, you, what, do you, what do you make of that as you're sitting here looking at that? So that was an actual cover, Bloomberg Business Week, April of 2014. What's some of your reaction to that as you sort of see that without even reading the article? Anybody? You're saying you're, you're surprised it was only four years ago? Yeah. 
Yeah, 2014. What else, what other reactions do you have? Sad, say some more, sad how? So, so it's asking women in this case to make a choice and the choice is between parenthood and professional, right? So it's tragic, right? Now, this is, I want to show you another cover that never did happen. <laughs> okay, so there you have one on the left that actually did happen, and it's sad. The other one, there was immediately laughter to it, which for me tells me as just another data point of the world that we as men and women, particularly in corporate life, continue to inhabit. We think we're in the same space, but we're really being judged and operated by really different pieces. Now, for many of the women in the room, this is, again, one assumption that I have, maybe an incorrect one, that this is what you have learned not only to live with, but to navigate and not have it be a big deal breaker. And for many of us men in the room, occasionally we're aware of it, and lots of times I am still not. And I am finding myself overly dependent on the women in my life, personally and professionally, to have to sort of be there as my buoy to keep me educated and informed. And that by itself is incredibly exhausting, fatiguing, and unsustainable. So this notion about um, stepping into this work for me is not about how can I help those people, in this case, half the sky who happen to be female, what I can do to sort of create gender equality as if somehow that your job is to sort of tell me what to do. And by the way, when you tell me what to do for the 54th time and for the 55th time when I say, I, I didn't get that, there's a fatigue that sets in or a little, not a little, a lot of annoyance on your part of saying, Bill, how come we have to have this conversation yet again? And so part of this work that I've come to see, and this is what I've been doing for the last 30 years of working with men in particular, but actually all leaders, is to say, what's the role of men in creating gender equality. And it is certainly to help women be able to bring their innate intelligence, skill, ability, and potential into the workforce so that it is not judged based on their gender, but simply because of their talents and abilities. But it also is because I and other men have been severely impacted, negatively impacted, by a system where part of myself, I was taught when I was this high to keep that in the parking lot somewhere or out at the tram stop, that I couldn't bring that to the professional environment. And that's been a tragedy. And so I just want to start with just acknowledging, and from the earlier session in here at 11, I was noticing that we all are living through, we're beneficiaries, not beneficiaries, we are impacted by a patriarchal system which has set up a system that basically you know, I'm applauded and rewarded by doing this work and my female colleagues in my firm who do this work are seen as a pain in the you know what when they say and do the exact same things that I do and I say that in front of a group of men, they're a little bemused by it, but I have, I'm usually met with a lot more, well, that's really interesting, tell me more, particularly when they disagree. So I have the privilege of being able to be an irritant without being accused of self-serving and uh, self-advocacy, which is one of the reasons that th this drives me. So I want to talk just for a second about this is another piece of research that Catalyst did in 2009. I love this uh, piece because it's relatively simple. And Elizabeth, it goes to some of what I just heard you uh, talk about with your research. What, they found three major obstacles for men for them to be visible gender equality champions. In other words, what stopped men from doing that? And I'm imagining that for many of the men that are in the room here, that this might be similar to you. And in a second, I'm actually asked some of the men to actually speak from not for all men, but just for yourself for a second, to how this, uh, any of this sort of impacts you, how you sort of have grappled with it. Obstacle one that really stops men is the lack of understanding or seeing gender equality as a women's issue, to the earlier piece, to equating that. When I think that this is about the other half of the sky, and I'm all in for that, when it gets hard, which it always does, and it's never ending, I lose my ability to sort of stand in the middle of the fire with my colleagues because I don't understand what's at stake for me and other men. 
So mutual self-interest, in, incredibly critical, is what this piece of research found. And that certainly has been backed up by our 30 years of work, of working with male leaders. So that's key. What's my interest in this? That parallels and connects with others' interests, in this case, other women, as well as other men. Second obstacle, fear, and this also really linked a lot to what um, I just heard Elizabeth talk about in a, a short way. This is fear of, uh, on a couple of levels, men making mistakes. The, the example I heard 20 years ago, I was working in an energy company in the US. I talked with a man who he said, Bill, he said, I am so unsure as to what to do in the morning. I'm afraid of opening the door for my female colleague going into the company headquarters because I'm chewed out for that. I'm also chewed out when I don't open the door. I don't know what to do. I try to avoid opening the doors <laughs> at a very basic sort of courtesy level. So here is a person who is attempting to show up at work in partnership, and he's getting a lot of feedback and data that suggests whatever he does, it's not going to work. So the privilege, again, for many men is we have the privilege of basically backing out of that, going into our man cave or whatever else we want to call it, and to say, I tried it once. It didn't work. And I really, there's no, no one's going to think bad of me not to be engaged again. And of course, I believe that that's really prob problematic. The other piece that's really driving that, though, is really a lot of the, what you just said, Elizabeth, about the status and rank jobs that we as men have learned to do to ourselves and other men. It's about not fitting into the club. It's about take, stepping out and literally having a part of your appendage cut off, a little bit like the Monty Python skit where the knight has all the appendages cut off and he's jumping around and saying, yelling, it's only a flesh wound. For many men, what I've noticed is there's a lot of men in corporate life who feel isolated and incredibly alone, which I know is difficult for lots of times women to understand because you are on the front lines of dealing with a system that is inequitable simply because of your gender, not your skill set. And you've got other men in the system who feel alone and isolated because they don't have a women's leadership resource group. They're taught to suck it up from a young age. Don't ask for help. Don't ask for support. Uh, the statistics show that a lot of men do not get uh, mental health care to the degree that women do. And it's not because men have less problems than women. It's because in the, the system and the society has told men, if you show that sign of weakness, you're seen as weak. That's then translated into what a good leader is which is strong, don't ask for help, show no chinks in the armor, um, which is fallacy, is impossible, and is, uh, is in, in, inhuman from my perspective. So this fear of making mistakes and fear of other men's disapprovals can really stop some of uh, men just short. So I want to stop at this point, and I, first of all, I want to acknowledge and appreciate the men that are in the room, and I want to just, I want to specifically ask the men in the room, if you're willing, and to do a short version of this, um, because this came up at 11. Why are you here? Why did you come to this conference at a personal level? Not because you were told, but what? Anybody willing to say, why, why are you here? What, what, what's, uh, what's in it for you? Yes, please, thank you. Yeah, hold on just a second. I've been engaged in culture in my organization for a long time. Um, and then I was asked that I want to be part of diversity and inclusion, and, and I did. So to one of the points that somebody made in an earlier talk today, asking someone if they want to be part of it and be part of the journey, I think that's part of, this, like, part of enabling greater participation. What have you noticed uh, for yourself and your learning in the four or five hours you've been here? Is this the first jump forum you've been to? Yeah. OK, what, 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 what's it been like, if you don't, if you don't mind, for you? Um, it's been interesting. I found it very enjoyable. I thought, um, I think a lot of the ideas are, um, they resonate very well. I think at the end of the last session, though, I felt that the conversation went off at a tangent a little bit about um, what is the role men have to play in it. And I felt that the conversation came a little bit around um, being disempowered rather than it being within our hands to make the change, we were relying on someone else. So I really so what, so what did that feel like for you when you were hearing that? What did what did you notice in your body? What did that feel like for you? It felt a little a little threatening. Uh -huh. But um, but but I, I mean not not in as much that isolated you're the enemy. It's that um, the reason there's the problem is um, that the men around here are, are to blame for that. And 
I, 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 don't get me wrong, I, I, I think the, the reality is the reason we have the problem in business today is because of historically we've had men in those positions who yeah. haven't made the right inclusive decisions. Yeah. Um, so let me first of all say thank you for actually honestly answering my question. You felt a little uncomfortable. I appreciate that. And for those that were in here that are female, it was a great conversation. So one of the things we're going to get to, and it's going to be very brief and it's in that handout, is don't collude. This is to women in the room. Don't collude when you hear from your male colleagues how we feel discomforted or out of our comfort zone. That's our work to do. And I really appreciate you being able to put that out there. And you keep, you tell us the truth. Tell me the truth. Tell the men in your life, personally and professionally, the truth. We can hang in there with each other through these sometimes tough conversations. We can, I can take it. We can, we can be there. So thank you for that. Other guys, uh, please. Here comes, here comes a mic. Yeah. The first question, why, why I'm here. Yeah, why you're here. Well, I'm here because, um, well, I'm passionate about creation. Mm -hmm. okay? I mean, something that we, we talk about it in our organizations. Creations is combinations of the best. Among the best, you need to combine the best people. And I think that participating to an event like this helps to overcome differences and make sure that we take the best of what we have. Mm -hmm. um, and overcome gender inequality will help us to, to get the best people in the team or the best people in the organizations or whatever, you name it. So and you I, used I was us. hoping to learn something on how to do it. What's one thing that you've learned so far or relearned? Um, well, one thing that I've learned is um, the fact that many of the things that we are saying today are valid in multiple occasions, mm -hmm. not just in respect to gender yes. equality. And, and that was a very good thing for me. And I, I learned about this concept of empathy yeah. and I'm putting myself in the other shoes. And, and I realized that um, on one thing that you were saying before, so um, I'm Italian and I moved to the UK uh, for work um, many years ago. And I realized I, I can remove my apathy only when suddenly I lost one of the privilege that yeah. I had. I was not anymore the same as everybody else. Yes. So I felt different and, and suddenly the concept of empathy started to grow in myself. Yes. And, and that was a very important thing. So thank you for that. There's a, a piece that I've seen in my career that I see three ways that men understand more about what's happening related to gender. Uh, first of all, if they have a uh, significant other that's female that's working outside the home, but at the high levels of organizations, it's rare for male or female execs to have that and actually have a life. So lots of times that's not there. If they have a daughter that's post-university and is now in the work world, that's one of the ways that that happens. And then the third way is when you've got, a, uh, particularly for Americans, because we're a little more clo clo cloistered when we have an overseas assignment and we get out of the culture and we actually are in someone else's like you just experienced coming from Italy to the UK. So thanks for that. Um, one other uh, gentleman? Yeah, okay. Uh, it started with decision with my wife. We did the same studies. We go, went out of university the same moment and we started working this at the same time. And we discussed time to time about our works and how it goes. And I didn't realize. I was like, sometimes she was explaining about how it's, she's struggling. And I was like, no, it's not possible. At the beginning, I wasn't even believing her. Yes. And then she was giving me examples. I was like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't notice that work. And for me, the first step was to being aware of it. And I, it took me, yeah, sometimes to realize it. And then for me, it was how to went from the passive to the active side and really to participate into being integrative about it. And so if, you, if I'm here today, today, it's really to understand on my point of view and also to be an actor about making the change. Yeah, well, I love that short story you just told about you. First of all, not I heard you say, I didn't even believe her. Sometimes because it is so different, um, I don't believe, but I still need to validate. I don't even need to understand, but validating. Uh, I don't know about you, but many men around the globe were really wired about, we want to immediately move from, we hear something like that, we want to go fix it. Anybody else resemble that comment? And lots of times, actually, my significant other of 25 years is here. Pam will say to me, Bill, I'm not asking to fix the dang problem. I just want to talk about where you're at. Let's talk. start, start first with feeling. How are you feeling? Oh, it's a feeling conversation. All right, so I can sort of access that as if somehow I've sort of stepped out of one box into another. When I do that enough times, I realize I always have feelings. Part of 
the cost for me about living in a patriarchal system is that I learned to suppress those feelings when I was this tall or this, this big and through life and then mostly feel numb instead, which is also a feeling, but it feeling it's a masking of other stuff. And so part of the thing for me is reclaiming over the last 40 years that I am a feeling, empathetic, intuitive, caring, compassionate human being. And the cost for me to not see that in myself puts more pressure on the other half of the sky to have to bring that into professional environments. And that's not sustainable for you, for me, for us. So thank to the three of you. Let's go on a little bit. We had a little bit more time. This last obstacle is ignorance. To your point, ignorance should not be confused with lack of an intellectual capability. It's what you've so beautifully put it, what I don't know that I don't know simply because I'm not living in someone else's shoes. This happens to be the person you care the most about. And she's telling you over and over and over and you were smart enough and loving enough to actually stop and listen to her particularly when you didn't see it or didn't believe it. Lots of times the ignorance that I show and other men show, again, this is I don't know that I don't know, gets misinterpreted as, Bill, you must be doing this on purpose because I see you competent and capable over here in your day job, so I don't believe that it's simply you're just blissfully ignorant. That can blow up our partnerships. And what I've seen particularly executive men do in response to that, which I don't think is very helpful, is to do what I call a fake it till I make it approach. Because they learn that that's not playing well with their direct reports and it's costing them. And so they basically get coaching or they get talking points from HR, from legal, and they're now reading stuff. They're saying all the right stuff, but nobody believes them because why? It's coming from up here and not from down here. And so... Having, being able to allow yourself to be at the place that you're at. So when I'm now conscious that I don't know something, which is often, I might say, actually, I'm more confused about many of these topics now, 40 years into it, than I was when I was blissfully having a nice life, doing really good work, but didn't know any of this was happening. And part of that is being able to be okay not to have conscious incompetence, which is knowing that I don't know, not, not having that be an end destination where I just sort of set up and build a condo and stay there the rest of my life but to actually say, this feels really awkward. I'm embarrassed that I don't know this and I'm age 61. I can't believe we've, you know, we're having to have this conversation yet again. I should know better. I've got to go through all of that as a way to sort of see myself through that to be able to get to that next place of conscious competence, which is the quadrant of practice, practice, practice. That's how you get better. That's how behavior changes. You know, every New Year's I make a resolution. This year I'm going to use, lose those 40 pounds. I go to the gym twice and it doesn't happen. And then I give up until the next New Year's. So it's about re rapidity. You've got to go do, be, behavior's got to be patterned over and over and over to create new patterns uh, and new habits, okay? How much more time do we have? 10 minutes? Great. So I want to show a little clip. This is, how many of the Procter & Gamble folks here in the audience? So this is, I love the work that you've done around the globe with your public service spots and some of your commercials. This is an Indian product. It's actually laundry detergent, aerial laundry detergent. There's the plug. And um, I watched your CEO last week in New York City show this at the Catalyst Awards dinner. I've been using this spot since it's been out. And at first glance, what you're going to see between a father, actually a grandfather who's visiting his daughter, and what is dawning on him, he's going from what he didn't know that he didn't know so now he's aware of some things and he wants to go back into his life with his wife and do something different. Now, what he does can feel really trivial. He basically starts to do the laundry. And you can mock that and say, that, that's, you know, that's ridiculous. But really, it's, it's about how do we share the load? So this is not simply one half of the sky's problem that the rest of us just basically sign up and say, tell me what I need to do next, as if somehow that's your job. So take a look at this little... PNG clip called Share the Load, and then we'll chat about that. Nana, Yedeko. Shield, leg, and helmet. Homework, ho gaya. Mommy, Yedeko. Here's the dog. Laga diya. Papa, you need to have to go to the Hello? Yeah, I'm just going to send you the email in five minutes. Yeah, give me five minutes. I'm working on the present. Mary, Choti Si Gulia. Kitni Badi Ho Gai. Ghar Ghar Khelti Thi. Ab Ghar Samhalti Hai. Office Samalti. I'm so proud. And I'm so sorry. 
सॉरी कि ये सब तुम्हें अकेले करना पड़ता है सॉरी कि जब तुम घर घर खेलती थी तो मैंने तुम्हें रोका नहीं ये नहीं कहा कि ये सिर्फ तुम्हारा काम नहीं है तुम्हारे हस्बैंड का भी है पर कहता भी कैसे है और मेरी ग्रीन शर्ट धो देना मैंने भी तो कभी तुम्हारी मम्मी की हेल्प नहीं की और तुमने जो देखा वही सीखा तुम्हारे हस्बैंड ने भी बचपन में यही देखा होगा घर घर खेलते वक्त वो टीवी देखने की या न्यूज़पेपर पढ़ने की एक्टिंग करता होगा और तुम जैसी कोई छोटी सी लड़की चाय बनाने की एक्टिंग करती होगी उसके डैड की तरफ से सॉरी तुम्हारे डैड की तरफ से सॉरी और हर उस डैड की तरफ से सॉरी जिसने कई कई सालों से एक गलत एग्जाम्पल सेट किया पर अभी भी देर नहीं हुई इस सॉरी के साथ मैं अपनी तरफ से एक छोटी सी कोशिश करूंगा कि घर के काम में मम्मी की हेल्प करूं किचन का किंग ना बन पाऊं तो कम से कम लॉन्ड्री में तो हाथ बटाऊं इतने साल एक गलत एग्जाम्पल सेट किया है अब कुछ सही कर जाऊं तुम्हारा पापा so let's not talk about necessarily um laundry although we really need to do that that's fine i want to talk i want to invite again some of the men in the room to say so what is what's it mean for you to share the load related to gender equality what do you know coming in what have you relearned again this today um what's what's it mean for you to share the load with gender equality anybody uh, this is for the men please and i don't know where the mics Here it comes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe I have an insight for it because I had the chance maybe to work for the last of more than 25 years now for companies who already integrated all the gender uh, issues of women. I work for more than 60% of our, our businesses uh, of women. So, um, but I'm still surprised, and it's in fact my insight of, for me today, is that the discussion is still on men and women. It's not just above on the biases and to work on the real biases, because it's not only men and women again. Hmm. I work a lot with millennials in the company and so on, and you don't even talk about men and women for millennial, millennials today. So uh, I'm pretty surprised of, surprised of all these discussions that are still only on that level. Yeah, and so one of the things I would invite you to do is to notice what is behind your surprise, what, what might be, why it is that you're a little shocked about why that's going on, and then f from your place of power in the organization you're in, what's your next sort of step forward in those partnerships with other men in the organization as well as women? So thank you for that. Um, just a little bit louder. There needs to be a share of duties. I mean, it's helping each other. There shouldn't be a predefinition of how these duties should be distributed. But sharing, I think it's, it's a very valid and important. Thing. And I appreciate that. And then that bumps straight into, Elizabeth, what you talked about, which is I leave at 4 o'clock to go to my grandchild's choir rehearsal. I'm a Renaissance man. My wife, grandma, does that. Who's a work? Who's still working? She's seen as not going to, not committed to the project, not committed to the team, and so I have a lot more latitude to be sort of the Renaissance person, and then and then just assuming that well, you can do that also because we've done all this great work in the last thirty years, and I'm not listening to how it's impacting women in my organization or on my team or in, in my little firm, and it's not about woe is them. It's about why is it that I don't know that and what is why are they not able to tell me their truth because they've obviously told it to me, but I didn't hear it. And it's not about me fixing it for them because that's a little demeaning and patriarchal. It is about me not noticing that this is happening all around me. So there's work to be done. Like we're never, there's no, there's, how many of you are in safe manufacturing operations, right? So your safety mindset, same thing about inclusion. We're never done with this. We've got to inculcate that into everything that we do. Yes.
from your childhood just see it from the beginning? Well, As one would one would think it's just the, simply an edu a lack of education. I think it's it, for, it starts there. For yeah, me. but I think it's also really baked into the fact that I've grown up in a patriarchal system that has made me be rewarded to be not able have to see this with no perceived short and long term cost. And then it's on in this case, my female colleagues, we could have the same conversation about age with millennials, we could have the same conversation about ethnicity, nationality, uh, etc. Yes, sir. Personally, sharing the load for me, is not even a question. It's about being a team and the work has to be done. So if it's one or the other, I, it says the same in the team, if there is 100 percent to do, okay, everyone does, does 25 and the, the work will, will be done. So if I'm going home, there is something to do, I'll do it. And if she's going, going, coming home, she does it. So there is no share of the load. It's only we are a team, we do the load. And together, for, for us, it's not even a question. Yeah. So I appreciate that at home. Bring it into the corporate life. And this is, we're involved, our firm is involved with Catalyst with their MARC program, Men Advocating Real Change. And a lot of the work that we do there is saying, how, what's our work with men intervening with other men in a, in a work setting when the conversation goes a little south, somebody makes an offhanded comment, there's no women in the room, we're noticing it's not okay, and I, and I find myself remaining silent. And I got to say to myself, and this is sort of an American thing, don't kill a mosquito with a hatchet. But at the same time, for me to be silent, I collude with the very behavior that I find objectionable. So how do I raise this back to intervening for me as a man with other men without wanting to sort of take the guy out at the knees? And part of that is sort of uh, some of these tips here that we've collected over the years, um, which we're not going to get a chance to discuss, but you can use those to look at what's my work with other men, which is a whole nother corner of the universe that's never done. And then I've got, and that, that informs my work across, in this case, gender with women. And then women, you have your own work to do with other women. Somebody mentioned that the statistics show that a lot of women prefer to report into male managers because of this patriarchal system that has clouded what good leadership behavior looks like and tilted that towards more typically male behaviors. When women do the same behaviors, they're called not real fun words. Some of them start with letters like B. And yet, there is this disparity. So I think we're probably up, bumped up against our time, Dorothy. Three or four minutes. So another, any other comments? What does it mean to share the load for any of the gentlemen? For you, and particularly, I'd say share the load at work. What's that mean? For me, it's not just doing it. It's being proud of doing it. Right? For me, it's not, you said it's not just doing it. It's being proud of doing it. Here comes the mic. No, it doesn't sound like it. So it's not, I, I'll try to be loud. Okay. <laughs> it's not yeah. just doing and sharing the load, but not being afraid of telling others that, that you are doing it. So being supportive and uh, stand up for the fact that you are supportive. So share your experience as a man that you are actually doing that. So my husband is not ashamed of saying that he did my daughter's hair, yeah. right? But a lot of people do it but they are ashamed of making it public and making it visible. So we are lucky models. There are actually good men out there, but still the society is telling them to hide. Well, and I think you said, I love it. There's still good men out there. I'd say the vast, I'd say the vast majority. I would say, so hear me on this. I'd say the vast majority of men in the workplace are good people. We've done, a, we've done a good job of getting egregious forms of mistreatment and misbehavior out of professional environments. I know they still happen. My experience, that's the easy stuff to manage. It's the stuff that I do from a place of really positive intent that I'm not even aware of. And that gets sort of obscured with, I must be, you know, I must be doing this on purpose. And I think we, we got to really separate to say, who among us are the evildoers? Coming back to one of the earlier American presidents that I thought was the problem, but now we have another. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyway, that this is everyone's work. There's no there there, as opposed to we are the chosen ones, and we're going to go out and sort of save those poor, you know, disparate souls that are, are the problem. One more uh, person, anything about what's it mean to share the load? And particularly, I want to get another gentleman. Thank you. And if you can, it work. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so for me, sharing the load is more about being proactively helping in a way. 
what happens and what I see at work is that sometimes some of the tasks the, the men wouldn't take because they wouldn't see the importance of it. And uh, I would say my, my colleague women, they, they have this eye to say, okay, this is important and we have to work together. And uh, for, for me, sharing the load is being more sensitive to what's happening, being uh, understandable about what needs to be done and taking the load from one to the other, whatever the task is. And that's how I, I think. Yeah, I love that. It's just really fine-tuning our observational skills to notice stuff that has always been going on, but it's sort of it just bypassed us for lots of different reasons. And there's something about when you, in, when you intervene with, in my behavior and we've got a permission to be able to do that, that's infectious. It starts to say, let's help to hold each other accountable to get better, to be better men, to be better colleagues at work which then takes the load off of our female colleagues that see this go on and say, what's it going to cost me if I bring it to Bill's attention? And they watch, they look, and it's because that's not your job. I mean, we can actually, if we actually got, if we actually did more of this, we'd actually get to the real work that we're trying to do to be profitable, if that's your, your motive, right? So our work really informs how we then come across partnership. Let's hold it there, and yeah. Dorothy, come back to you. Thank you very much.